All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are really excited to see uh, so many friends and colleagues from across our state and also other states joining us for this learning opportunity. A bit of housekeeping, if you can change your Zoom name so that it matches how you registered, that will help us with knowing which colleagues are here. Um, and we are really excited to kick off this expert webinar series uh, featuring Dr. Jack Fletcher from the University of Houston. We have a lot of wonderful content to explore and we have created a Padlet for you to download uh, a PDF of Dr. Fletcher's slides. Wynn will be putting those the Padlet link in the chat right now and she'll put it in throughout in case people are joining us um, a little bit later. So next slide. So the, the California Dyslexia Initiative um, is funding this opportunity. And we are, we at the Sacramento County Office of Education are the project lead. I'm Tammy Wilson, and I'm a director here at the Sacramento County Office of Education. And my colleagues from Sacramento are on the line with us. So Wynn and Marina and Deirdre are here to support. Um, and many other colleagues from our county office. One of the goals of the California Dyslexia Initiative is to provide professional learning opportunities within the system of support and across our state to really build knowledge, skill, and capacity around teaching and supporting students who are at risk for reading difficulties and those who have dyslexia. So within this uh, initiative, we are just really delighted to partner with Glean Education to deliver this expert webinar series. And I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Hammond, my friend and colleague. Uh, Jessica is the founder and CEO of Glean Education, and she is coordinating our efforts in this expert webinar series. Jessica. Thank you, Tammy. And next slide. Um, we are really thrilled. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're really thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who may not know about us at Glean Education, we partner with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training and web-based coaching to support teachers to better understand current research and implement evidence-based literacy instruction to improve student literacy outcomes. Next slide, please. You can check us out at gleaneducation.com or on Twitter at gleaneducation. So this is a first in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of the nation's top experts in the field. If you haven't registered for them yet, we'll be popping some registration links in the chat so you can be sure not to miss them. Next slide, please. Today, I have the incredible privilege of introducing you to Dr. Jack Fletcher, our expert presenter for today's webinar on identifying and treating students at risk for reading difficulty. Dr. Fletcher is the Hugh Roy and Lily Krantz Cullen Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Houston. A board certified child neuropsychologist, Dr. Fletcher has spent his 40 plus years in the field completing research related to neurodevelopmental disorders, neurobiological correlates, and intervention. He's the author of over 400 papers and directs an NICHD funded National Learning Disability Research Center. He has been the recipient of the Samuel T. Orton Award for the International Dyslexia Association and a co-recipient for the Albert J. Harris Award from the International Reading Association. He's also been a past president of the International Neuropsychological Society. With that, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Jack Fletcher. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to people in California about uh, dyslexia. Uh, I'm not quite sure if people can see my uh, background. The only person that I can see is Jessica. Uh, but the reason the Golden Gate uh, Bridge is up, if you actually see that, do people see that, Jessica? Uh, is because my uh, daughter and son-in-law and grandson live in Sacramento. 
And so some time ago, I put that up uh, just to remind myself of where my uh, family lives, since I'm still stuck in Houston and still trying to get to uh, California. Uh, what I'm going to do today is give you an introduction to dyslexia. I know that the shorthand for my talk is about identifying uh, students with dyslexia, but it's going to be a much broader talk. Uh, than that, and I'm going to try and give you uh, an introduction that prepares you for the talks that are coming up uh, next. The, uh, the viewpoints that uh, I'm expressing are mine and my colleagues, and you will certainly hear things that, uh, that some of you will be troubled for, but I just want to assure you that uh, I believe that I can support the uh, points that I make uh, with evidence. And I'll give you my uh, email address and website address uh, at the end if you want more information. Um, the best way to think about dyslexia is as a word level reading disorder. Uh, there, there is a lot of controversy about definitions of dyslexia and exactly what is meant. Uh, but the primary defining attribute is a, a problem being able to identify and spell words uh, in isolation if you see them once, one at a time. It is the uh, most common and the best understood form of learning disability. And I use the term dyslexia synonymously for any child that has what I would call a word level uh, reading uh, problem. Uh, some people think that dyslexia isn't really served by uh, special education through the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, but in fact, it's the largest single group of students in special education and represents almost two out of every five uh, children who are identified uh, for special education. Uh, but there are a lot of children who are not identified for special education who have word level uh, reading problems. Uh, an idea, uh, dyslexia is referenced as a basic reading problem, and I've been explaining this uh, to many states. Uh, the reason the term dyslexia is not in IDEA is not an oversight, it was deliberate. And when IDEA was originally formulated uh, in 1975, there was a deliberate decision to, to leave out terms that were considered to be medicalized, like dyslexia, minimal brain dysfunction, de developmental aphasia, and so on, and to restrict it to terms uh, that were primarily uh, educational, which is where basic reading uh, comes from. It's the idea uh, that a child has a problem with foundational reading skills, which would be things like word recognition uh, and spelling. Uh, the key to overcoming dyslexia is to prevent it. Uh, but then we need to have intensive remedial services uh, for children who uh, emerge from a prevention process as inadequate uh, responders. Uh, so to summarize, dyslexia occurs primarily at the level of the single word. It involves the ability to decode and spell printed words in isolation, both accurately and automatically. And that's a very important consideration because in languages like uh, English, which where the relationship between what words look like and what words sound like is not uh, transparent, uh, we, pr we produce kids with dyslexia who are very inaccurate and have trouble sounding out uh, words in languages where the relationship between what words look like and what words sound like, like Spanish or German, uh, kids are much more likely to emerge uh, with a spelling problem or with an automaticity problem in decoding. So the primary test, for example, in German uh, is a, a timed uh, word reading list as opposed to a simple measure of word reading accuracy and spelling. Uh, we all know that it's associated uh, with problems with phonological processing and that it leads to uh, problems reading text and understanding text, but it is not by definition a text level disorder. Any explanation of dyslexia that relies on text, like funny eye movements or things of that sort, is not an adequate explanation uh, of dyslexia because a child with dyslexia has problems dealing with words uh, in isolation. Uh, perhaps the most important observation about dyslexia is that it represents a failure to master the alphabetic principle. And the alphabetic principle is the idea that print represents speech through the alphabet or some other visual symbol. When you hear Mary Ann Wolfe, she'll talk very eloquently uh, about this uh, idea. The relations between uh, print and speech are not arbitrary. They do represent uh, the sounds and speech. And regardless of the surface uh, appearance, what we call the orthography in print, words represent internal units that are based on sound. 
uh, which we would call phonemes. When kids learn to read, uh, what they have to do is they have to make explicit what is inherently an implicit understanding that words have internal structures that are linked to sounds. And the understanding of that is what we call phonological awareness. It is an overarching understanding that uh, words are composed of sounds, that the basis for uh, understanding print is to be able to relate it to the sounds in the language system. And so the metaphor that we would use is that reading is parasitic uh, on language, uh, but that is in fact an incomplete uh, story, which we'll get to. Uh, one of the important things to understand is that uh, when we talk about the attributes of dyslexia, the things that the, the, the attributes that we use to define it, like poor reading skills or spelling skills, or instructional response. Uh, they exist on a continuum. Uh, and dyslexia is fundamentally a dimensional disorder. It's uh, not really a category, even though we treat it as a category. And so dyslexia per se is a variation on normal development. It's the lower end of a normal distribution of reading skills. Uh, and as such, it's like uh, hypertension or obesity, where there's no natural demarcation telling us that somebody has uh, dyslexia. Uh, the uh, distinctions about uh, uh, blood pressure or obesity are, are also uh, arbitrary, not in the same way, uh, but certainly they're not like the flu or broken leg where there are clear signs uh, uh, of the uh, disorder. Uh, and so if somebody says, wants to know how many uh, kids have dyslexia, the correct answer is how many would you like? Because to a certain extent, it's an arbitrary uh, determination. Now, obviously, it's not completely arbitrary, but the uh, line dividing kids who are dyslexic uh, from kids that have that are average or, or poor readers uh, is fuzzy uh, at best. Uh, is caused and influenced by both genetic and environmental, environmental factors. And I always highlight uh, what I regard as one of the most prominent environmental factors, which is inadequate instruction, instruction that does not uh, teach the alphabetic uh, principle. Uh, when we talk about identification, uh, people uh, often want to do very elaborate assessments of dyslexia. I'm a, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. I know how to spend hours uh, giving kids uh, tests. I do not spend hours giving uh, kids tests for problems like dyslexia or ADHD because we understand a great deal about what the markers uh, are. And dyslexia is best identified through assessments of reading and spelling skills and uh, instructional response. It cannot and should not be identified independently of efforts to instruct particularly in the lower grades. Uh, we have a big emphasis on screening. What screening tells us uh, in the lower grades is that a child is at risk. It does not allow us to diagnose dyslexia. And you really cannot dis diagnose dyslexia independently of efforts to instruct uh, the child. Um, in my assessments, I don't give IQ tests uh, to determine if a child has dyslexia. Uh, and one term, one phrase that people often use is the idea that dyslexia is uncoupled from IQ. Now, I'm not talking about kids that have intellectual disabilities. That's a separate issue. And if I thought a child had an intellectual disability, I would certainly assess IQ and adaptive behavior. But for most kids, uh, IQ is irrelevant uh, to dyslexia because it occurs across the range of IQ. Methods for the identification of learning disabilities that are based on IQ discrepancy or patterns of cognitive strengths and weaknesses are unreliable and lack uh, validity. And it isn't really necessary to assess processing skills in an older child uh, who's been exposed to instruction, uh, even with dyslexia. For example, in uh, older kids, I do not assess phonological awareness or rapid naming. I would do tests of word recognition and uh, reading fluency uh, because on average kids who can't uh, read words accurately and fluently are going to have phonological awareness and rapid naming pro uh, problems and I'm always very oriented towards assessing quickly and getting kids into treatment as quickly as possible. When we talk about screening uh, we're not talking about diagnosis and we're not talking about progress monitoring. Screening is rapid triage that does not burden the teacher. Uh, the goal is to determine who needs more assessment. And the assessment may be something like a reading inventory, 
or it may be progress uh, monitoring, uh, but it should be very fast. The types of screeners that we work with uh, should uh, take less than five minutes. Uh, and what we do is we, we gear these uh, screeners towards the minimization of false negative errors, even if it, it increases false positive errors. And there's a reason for that. A false negative error means that we've done a screening, it's very quick. Uh, if we have a false negative error, we have failed to identify a child who has risk characteristics of dyslexia. Uh, that's a very serious error because uh, we need to do early intervention. Uh, with kids. And so it's better when you're screening to allow false positive errors, which means that you may identify a child as having risk characteristics who doesn't have risk characteristics, but you should not take that child and put them immediately into intervention. What you should do is some sort of assessment and to begin to monitor their progress and then begin to intervene with kids who show inadequate progress very quickly. Uh, we, for example, would progress monitor for two months uh, in first grade and then introduce uh, some kind of early intervention. Uh, it is not possible to separate students with dyslexia from others that have foundational reading problems. There are no magic markers. Uh, people talk about uh, differences relative to IQ or to listening comprehension or to things like that. But none of these hypotheses uh, ever hold up except for one and that's instructional response. The big difference among kids uh, who are at risk for dyslexia is who responds to instruction and who doesn't. And that is the only classification uh, that I can uh, validate in the research that I've done. So screening should be very quick. In kindergarten, the, uh, two, the, the, the subtests that are most uh, predictive are timed and untimed letter names and sounds. Uh, what a child knows about uh, letters. Uh, and letter sound relations and phonological awareness. And it varies depending on whether you're screening at the beginning of kindergarten or the end of kindergarten, uh, where phonological awareness becomes increasingly uh, important. At the beginning of, of grade one, it's timed and untimed uh, word reading and phonological awareness. But by the end of grade one and grade two, I know this uh, is a little controversial, but it's, it's, an, empir it's uh, an empirical finding. Uh, you need to do timed and untimed uh, word reading because uh, at that point, if a child's been exposed to formal reading instruction and they're not reading at uh, grade level, they are at risk for uh, dyslexia. And so what we need to do is embrace the concept of risk, reserve eligibility for comprehensive uh, evaluation, and recognize that it's very important to identify dyslexia independently of efforts to uh, treat it, first in the core uh, classroom and then through uh, supplemental intervention. Uh, one of the consequences of screening uh, should be uh, entrance into a progress monitoring uh, assessment. Um, and the best measures for progress monitoring at kindergarten are time knowledge of letter sounds. Uh, in grades one and three, three, one through three, it's time word reading, either lists or passages. And in grades four through eight, uh, a maze, a passage that has a maze because it has a comprehension uh, component. Uh, people want to make screening and progress monitoring much more elaborate than it needs to be. Uh, and really need to minimize assessment uh, whenever we can. Uh, dyslexia is part of a complex presentation. Uh, you can certainly see children uh, who have dyslexia whose primary problem is uh, reading and uh, that's almost their exclusive problem. Uh, but uh, it's also very common to see children that have other kinds of learning disabilities like a math problem and dyslexia or to have dyslexia and ADHD. And these problems are very important uh, to identify because you can't adequately treat dyslexia if you treat it as an isolated reading problem. You have to take into account the complexity of the uh, problem. To understand that, uh, we certainly know that there are genes, uh, for example, that affect uh, reading proficiency and make kids at different levels of risk to be a good, good reader or a poor reader. Uh, but we also know that there are generalist genes that affect multiple forms of learning disability and attention deficit disorder. This is called the continuity hypothesis. And some people call these generalist genes uh, because they're involved in reading, in math, uh, and in ADHD. 
But this leads directly to the concept of comorbidity, which is the idea of co-occurring problems. ADHD is common, about 50% of children with dyslexia on average also meet criteria for ADHD. There is very strong uh, evidence from clinical trials that you get much better results if you treat both the dyslexia and the ADHD than if you treat only one of these uh, problems. If language and working memory problems are significant, uh, math will be impaired. Uh, anxiety is a common response in kids who are struggling to learn to read. In one study that we did, one of the best predictors of inadequate response to instruction in grade one was the uh, child's level of anxiety. Uh, and so uh, my colleagues, uh, Amy Grills and uh, Sharon Vaughn, actually designed a reading intervention with and without uh, an anxiety reduction. Uh, tool, and they're evaluating that presently to see what effect mindfulness training for five minutes has before a reading lesson uh, in grade one. Uh, if you have dyslexia, written expression and reading comprehension are almost always impaired, but uh, even if you're dealing with comorbid presentations, the relation between phonological processing and decoding always shines through the glare of uh, complexity. Uh, dyslexia can often be prevented. I can't tell you how much trouble I get into for uh, saying this uh, because um, a lot of people uh, understand dyslexia to be something that you're born with and they think about it as something that you're hardwired uh, for. But in fact, the neural systems that uh, mediate reading and that are impaired uh, in, in children with dyslexia are actually malleable. Uh, and if you get the child into reading intervention early enough, uh, you really can not prevent the reading problem. It may not present, prevent some of the other problems that are associated with dyslexia, but it will prevent the primary problem that's associated with adaptation. If you wait uh, and you start identifying kids with dyslexia in grade three, which is very common, remediation itself requires much more intensity and much more intensity than schools are commonly able uh, to provide. So the skills that prevent dyslexia need to be prevent, need to be taught early uh, in school. Uh, but remediation after grade two uh, is associated with diminishing uh, returns. And that's from the work of Carol Connor, who is at uh, Irvine, uh, and Maureen Lovett, who I also think is in, in California uh, at this point uh, in time. Uh, so remediation. If your idea is to create special schools, wait for kids to fail, uh, and then put uh, kids with dyslexia all together with a special teacher uh, is not a solution to overcoming dyslexia. We should absolutely try and treat kids with dyslexia, but we should reserve remediation for inadequate responders who show intractability. And the problem is that although we can teach decoding uh, usually at any age with sufficient intensity, the problem is automaticity. It's very difficult to make uh, kids automatic because reading rate uh, is limited because they simply don't have the sight word vocabulary that they have. And that's because they don't access print early in schooling. To develop a sight word vocabulary and to program the neural systems that are responsive for automatic word reading, you need to have access to print uh, early in development. Uh, and without that, you really can't introduce the neural organization that's really necessary uh, for proficient word reading. And so if you wait three to five years to really begin intensive intervention for kids with dyslexia, uh, how do you catch the kid up when they're already so far behind uh, in this opportunity to develop the neural reorganization that's necessary? It's not age, it's experience and exposure. That's the critical uh, element. Uh, and so this uh, slide is from one of the best remedial studies that I know, which was done by Joe Torgerson, who gave uh, kids uh, who were in third, fourth, and fifth grade in special education, uh, different kinds of very intense uh, remedial interventions. He gave them 70 hours of intervention in, uh, in eight weeks. And he got excellent uh, outcomes. Uh, you can see at the end of the study, the kids were accurate on average. The kids uh, had good comprehension, had, had better comprehension skills. Uh, but look at their reading rate. They were still extremely slow. 
Uh, and even though they were extremely slow, this study is very important because 70% of the kids uh, were able to decode, read word, had word recognition skills that were at average levels, and 40% of these kids left special education altogether. But they could not, on average, read grade level text with any kind of automaticity. And that's the problem. If you do early intervention, uh, prevention studies show that 70 to 90 percent of children who are at risk, uh, defined uh, by the bottom 20 percent in kindergarten, grade one and grade two, can learn to read in the average range, and it prevents the problems with automaticity. Uh, here, the blue line represents uh, accuracy, the red line represents automaticity or fluency. Uh, the two uh, slides where you see the big discrepancy between the red, between the blue and red are remedial studies. Uh, and you can see that uh, remedial interventions associated with this discrepancy between accuracy and uh, fluency. The, the, the two lines where you don't see the discrepancy are early intervention studies, where there's no discrepancy between accuracy and fluency. And that's because uh, the child had access to print early and was able to develop the neural systems that are uh, necessary for proficient reading. To prevent and remediate dyslexia, you have to treat it in the context of MTSS, a multiple tiered system of supports or what people used to call RTI. Uh, the reason is that it facilitates early identification through universal screening and progress monitoring. Uh, we have to focus on instruction and we have to amplify the role of general education instruction because of the amount of time that kids uh, spend there. Uh, MTSS systems amplify the role of general education instruction. Uh, when somebody asks me, what are we going to do about all the children with dyslexia? My answer is always to enhance core uh, instruction. That's the most important thing that we can do. Start early, enhance core uh, instruction, reserve uh, supplemental and remedial interventions for kids who don't respond to core instruction. Uh, an MTSS system gives us data on instructional response and we need that to personalize instruction for kids with uh, dyslexia. Isolating uh, students with dyslexia uh, as a disorder that must be remediated is a recipe for persistence. And then restricting eligible interventions, which is being done in a lot of state uh, regulation for children uh, with dyslexia to those that meet a traditional definition of multi-century. Uh, which means things like sandpaper writing and learning to learn in all the different modalities uh, is not empirically supported. And what we prefer is the term multimodality instead of multi-century, which means that you see the word, you say the word, you write the word, and that's a characteristic of many interventions that teach kids at a sublexical level. There are lots of interventions that teach decoding skills using different approaches to uh, accessing the relation between print and sound. And we need multiple ways for kids to do this because there's no one approach that works with all kids. So effective intervention involves a strong core reading program that teaches decoding, fluency, and comprehension according to the National Reading Panel. It adds tier two instruction that builds upon tier one instruction for struggling readers. And in tier three, you might isolate an area like decoding that is not uh, developing, but you want to have relatively few kids that you're doing tier three intervention with. You need to use developmentally appropriate and personalized instructional uh, practices. For example, uh, phonological awareness uh, skills need to be taught in kindergarten and grade one and to kids that really have severe dyslexia, but you want to move to a letter-based component as soon as possible uh, as the child move, masters phonological awareness skills to promote uh, generalization. If you have a core reading program that does not have these three practices, decoding, and I'm, I'm defining decoding as something that exists on a continuum with uh, phonics, phonological awareness, spelling, and so on, fluency practices and comprehension, you will produce kids that are struggling uh, in that area. If you have a balanced literacy program that teaches phonics incidentally, you will produce kids that look like they have dyslexia uh, and you won't be able to tell the difference at a neural level. But if, if all you're doing is teaching decoding and you don't have practice or you don't have a comprehension component, you'll just produce kids that have word callers. So we need comprehensive integrated approaches at tier one and at tier two. Uh, there is no specificity of appropriate uh, interventions. 
uh, for kids with dyslexia. What research supports are adjectives like explicit, which is probably the most important adjective. That is teacher-led, teacher-directed instruction. It supports the idea of comprehensive approaches, that comprehensive approaches uh, appear to work better than approaches that are, that are less comprehensive and teach isolated kinds of skills. And then it, appro it supports approaches that are personalized or differentiated, that take into account uh, learner characteristics and do uh, homogeneous grouping, for example, in the classroom. And that's true both at a classroom, a core, classroom level and at a supplemental level. It does not support multi-sensory in a traditional sense. It does not support uh, a curricula that are described as balanced because of the incidental phonics component. Uh, manualized approaches to uh, teaching reading are fine, but it doesn't have to be that way if you feel like it deprofessionalizes uh, teachers. Uh, it absolutely does not support the idea of multiple cueing systems. There is only one way that kids should be taught to uh, deal with words they don't know, and that is to sound it out. If you start teaching kids to guess, the kids that we most disadvantaged by that are kids who are struggling the most learning to read. It doesn't support discovery or constructionist uh, types of approaches, and it also doesn't appro support approaches that are so rule-based uh, that all they do is teach relations between what words look like and sound like with no practice, no exposure to print, uh, and no comprehension uh, instruction. And then perhaps one of the most important things that Carol Connor uh, reported is that if you're doing what you should do in the classroom, it's not just content. It's not just differentiating the amount of code-based versus meaning-based instruction. It's also learning to go between small group and large group uh, instruction. But what she found is that code-based instruction is much more effective in small groups than to the entire class, but that for comprehension instruction, there's no difference between small group and large group instruction. So small group instruction is especially important in the general education instruction for kids that are struggling to learn uh, uh, decoding skills. So to summarize principles of intervention, which you're gonna hear a lot more from people that are a lot more qualified than me, uh, you teach phonics explicitly as part of a comprehensive program that addresses multiple competencies, complex decoding skills, fluency and comprehension. You teach spelling in larger graphemic or morphological units. You prevent word recognition problems because remediation is difficult and requires considerable intensity, particularly for automaticity. But we always recognize that older students and adults can be taught word reading if the approach is sufficiently uh, intense. Uh, to give you an idea about what some of the studies uh, show, this, this is from a, one of the uh, most powerful uh, multi-tiered intervention studies that we did. It was done by Patricia Mathis and Carolyn Denton. And what we did in this study is we uh, screened uh, multiple schools, the entire classroom, with a five-minute uh, screener to identify kids that were at risk. Uh, we followed up with some additional short probe assessments with the at-risk kids to make sure that they were at risk. And then we gave kids either 90 minutes of instruction, uh, of quality core uh, classroom instruction, or 90 minutes of quality classroom instruction with a tier two intervention for 40 minutes per day in groups of three to four for about 30 weeks, about 70 hours of supplemental instruction. These are the results of that intervention study. Uh, at the top, you can see uh, a group of kids that were not at risk uh, here, and that's our benchmark for trying to help these kids catch up. We had two different kinds of reading interventions. One was highly manualized uh, in, in a direct instruction program, but the other taught uh, phonics explicitly, but in the context of reading and writing. It was not a balanced uh, program because of the uh, 10 minutes of explicit word work in every lesson. And what's important is that you can see that the kids that got the supplemental instruction uh, did much better than kids that only got tier one uh, instruction, but all three groups are closing the gap. And the best way that I have to illustrate that is to simply ask how many kids at, at the end of grade one did not meet uh, benchmarks, were inadequate responders. Well, if, only, if all you got was enhanced classroom instruction, there were 92 kids in that group. There were 15 of 92 that did not respond to the uh, classroom instruction. That's 16% of those kids. But remember that it's the bottom 20% 
of the classroom. So enhanced core classroom instruction by itself reduced the number of kids who are at risk from 20% to 3.2% of the school population. If you got both tier one and tier two, there were 163 kids. There were seven kids that didn't meet benchmarks. That's 4% of those groups. And that is less than 1% of the school population. So we have strong evidence that early intervention uh, is effective. Uh, we took the kids, by the way, that did not respond to intervention, gave them a tier three intervention uh, and cut that number in half uh, again in the next school year. Now contrast that with another study that Sharon Vaughn and I uh, did where we took the same principles, multi-tiered instruction. We did it with a cohort of middle school readers. Uh, if you don't know this, uh, if you actually, our, our screening test was actually the state test uh, and we identified all the kids uh, in grades six, seven, and eight that failed the uh, state reading comprehension test. 80% uh, of them had foundational basic reading skill uh, problems. Sharon ha actually had to go back and redesign the curriculum to introduce word work because of the number of kids that had not mastered uh, decoding skills uh, at that point. Uh, it turned into a three-year intervention study because at the end of year one, you can see that there's no difference on a comprehension measure here between kids that were in our treatment group and kids that got what the school typically uh, provided. So we decided to take out the kids that had responded adequately and we gave them uh, an additional year of intervention and we started seeing divergence at this point. And by the end of the third grade, uh, we had a huge treatment effect but a lot of these kids are still not very effective readers, even though almost every child passed the state accountability uh, test. But it took two years of intervention, uh, which was daily 50 minute uh, reading classes, along with enhanced uh, classroom instruction to uh, get these kids to show uh, progress. And many of them are still not reading at grade level. Why is early intervention uh, more effective than remediation? Well, neuroscience explains why. There are two metaphors. The first is that reading is parasitic on speech. That comes from uh, Alvin Lieberman, uh, who was one of the, uh, who was the leader of the group that discovered the alphabetic principle. And that is a brain system that is sublexical and dorsal. And I'll show you what that means in just a minute. That, that is basically the area of the brain that processes speech as a segmented uh, signal. And so to learn to read, that area of the brain has to learn to treat speech like treat speech like speech sounds. But then the second metaphor is that reading is unlocking language from vision or language at the speed of sight. Uh, and that is a, a different system that deals with uh, words in much larger uh, units with immediate uh, recognition. And these systems are malleable in development and in response to instruction but access and experience is the key for automaticity. This comes from something called dual route theory, where the dorsal route is sublexical. It has to break words up into constituent parts to get to their meaning. Uh, it has to access the phonological representation and identify the substituent parts, but that is a very inefficient uh, system. It's necessary for helping the child uh, learn to relate print and speech, uh, but it's not an efficient uh, system. It is a system that's fundamentally impaired in kids with uh, dyslexia. But the second system is called ventral, and that is a lexical system. It deals with uh, larger graphemic units of words. It goes directly from the word form of the word to the pronunciation or meaning uh, of the word. Uh, they operate in parallel depending on the uh, uh, what you need to operate with the word, how much you know about it. And this is what the reading brain actually uh, looks like. The dorsal system you can see down here where word would come into the visual cortex, uh, which is in the back of the brain. And then it would go up to this orange uh, area, which is vertices area uh, in general. Uh, and then down into the semantic regions that deal with uh, meaning. But as soon as you begin to uh, learn to read, whether you're an adult, with a literacy or a child that's learning to read or somebody with dyslexia, 
you start seeing uh, organization of this ventral system, particularly this area of the brain that's called the fusiform gyrus and what some people call the visual word form uh, area, where the word comes into the visual cortex, it goes uh, into the fusiform gyrus in that general region, and then it goes directly to the meaning. And so you can recognize what the word is uh, almost instant instantaneously based on the statistical probability by which letters and letter combinations uh, occur together. And that is a system that has to develop in order for us to become uh, proficient. And it starts to develop as soon as uh, kids begin to learn to read. None of these systems are specialized for reading. Reading is not a natural process. It has to be taught. These are evolutionarily based systems for language and for visual processing that have to be reorganized in order to support uh, reading. And they change even after intervention. Uh, in the intervention study I showed you early by Patricia Mathis, we did uh, brain imaging uh, before and after the intervention. Uh, this is the left hemisphere. I, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, it's on uh, the left side. Uh, but you can see good development of Wernicke's area right in the middle of the brain. Um, because we had kids speak, you can see activation of the speech pronunciation, which is Wernicke's area, and then activation of the ventral area down here. Uh, the child here is a responder, and you can literally see the emergence of this center, uh, of, of, of this neural network for reading, although it's bi still bilateral uh, at this point. It'll become increasingly lateralized over time. And then the child at the bottom did not respond and you see no development of the neural network uh, in the left hemisphere. Uh, so who is dyslexic? It is the student who does not respond to quality instruction. Uh, in order to understand neural processing in dyslexia, you have to take kids uh, and separate them into kids who respond to instruction and kids who don't respond to instruction. When we, when we started doing brain imaging studies, the only way that we could make sense out of the data uh, was to make that separation. So kids with dyslexia are hard to teach. They're not unable to learn. The key attributes are low achievement in reading and an adequate instructional response. It is often preventable with early intervention and it is absolutely heritable. Uh, kids with a family history are at risk, uh, but the neural systems are malleable uh, in relation to development and in relation to instructional response. And so I'll leave you uh, with this quotation from Alvin Lieberman, uh, who said that we're all born with dyslexia. Uh, nobody is born with the ability to learn to read. It has to be taught. What varies is how much instruction kids actually need. Uh, so he said, we're all born with dyslexia. The difference among us is that some are easy to cure and others are not. Uh, on this slide, you can see my uh, email address and I absolutely respond to emails. If you want to email me about the material, I put uh, our website address uh, up and you can find all the material that I'm talking about uh, on our website uh, and also find a lot of other information. And I always acknowledge the support of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jack. That was an absolutely wonderful and informative webinar. Thank you so very much. Uh, we have time for some questions, which I'm really excited to get to. But before that, I would like to just show you our survey for this webinar. Uh, we will be popping the link to the survey in the chat momentarily. If you could do that as we're asking questions of Dr. Fletcher, that would be great. Gives us perspective on how we did on this webinar and what you're interested in learning more about in the future. Okay, so some great questions in the Q&A. Um, one of the first questions we got was, you said that the key to treatment is prevention. Does this mean that dyslexia is preventable? I know you talked a bit about this, but we'd love to hear a little more. Well, when I, when I say it's, it's preventable, uh, what I mean by that is that a lot of students uh, early in development do, got, do not get the instruction that they need, uh, you know, for maybe 40 to 50% of kids, uh, uh, it's relatively easy to master the alphabetic principle. Uh, for a lot of kids, they uh, learn it just by reading, uh, being read to uh, by their parents and their parents draw their attention to the relationship of the print uh, and, the, and the, of the alphabet and, and what the alphabet sounds like. But a lot of kids uh, do not find that to be a, fair, a very natural kind of association. 
Uh, and so the term uh, that a lot of us use is instructional casualties, that kids emerge with dyslexia uh, because they didn't get the instruction that they needed early on that allowed them to master the alphabetic principle. Uh, and so in kids like that, um, and even in kids who, who have genetic risk, uh, if you provide uh, instruction that is intense enough uh, and that's targeted and teaches the alphabetic principle uh, explicitly as part of a comprehensive program, the number of kids who emerge who have the characteristics of dyslexia is greatly reduced. And that's what I mean when I talk about uh, preventing dyslexia. There are absolutely kids uh, whose response to instruction is intractable and who find this very difficult to learn, but I think that number is much lower uh, than the number of kids that we actually identify uh, with dyslexia. And that's what I mean when I say that the reading problem is preventable. We had another question concerning which specific screeners would you suggest that seem to yield reliable results? Well, I, I would refer people to the uh, guidelines for screening uh, that were produced by the International Dyslexia Association. Uh, I, have a, I, I have a conflict of interest because I develop uh, screeners that are, that are sold uh, out of state. And I don't want to uh, identify uh, products that I'm associated uh, with, but there is a list of uh, screeners uh, in, the, in the guidelines for early screening published by the International Dyslexia uh, Association, and those are excellent tools. The, the other thing that I would emphasize is that uh, the types of tools that are used for universal screeners uh, in MTSS, MTSS systems, uh, timed assessments of, of, of letter naming or uh, uh, word reading, uh, things of that sort are also very effective uh, screeners for dyslexia. One of the things that people don't understand about dyslexia screening is that uh, it doesn't make it better to give more tests. Uh, the different tests that we might give, like we might screen for real word reading, nonsense word reading, phonological awareness, uh, spelling, they're correlated. Uh, and there's some excellent work by Amanda Vander Vanderhaven that shows that the more screeners, that giving more screeners does not improve the reliability of the screener. So what you wanna do is to pick a screener, get in fast, do something that doesn't burden the teacher, that allows you to screen the entire school uh, multiple times a year, and then spend more time with kids who emerge as at risk. Do give them a reading inventory, pay real attention to the progress, mo to progress monitoring data, whatever your approach uh, is. But think about screening as a triage to, to a closer examination of the child. 80% of kids do not have dyslexia. They do not need uh, uh, extensive uh, screening. We got a question about the relationship of reversals and directionality. The question was, are those addressed through phonological instruction and explicit systematic instruction? Well, uh, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, we've known for many years that there's no relation of dyslexia with reversals or with directionality. Uh, and there is some excellent work by Stan DeHaan uh, in a book called The Reading Brain and in several papers that he's written where he's actually been able to show that reversals occur, occur in development because of mere representation uh, in the fusiform uh, gyrus. The fusiform gyrus is a, a part of the brain that's, that's responsible for rapid visual processing uh, of lots of things. Uh, for example, uh, if you teach uh, London, London, London cab drivers who have to memorize and pass a test on the London road system, uh, if you assess them with brain imaging before and after they learn the map system, they show huge changes in the right fusiform gyrus. The fusiform gyrus uh, in evolution is for processing faces, for objects and it's, it's evolved into a system for rapid visual processing of any kind. It's like a visual expertise system. So when you learn to read, what happens is that the left fusiform becomes very specialized. But as you learn to read, uh, you, you basically form mirror representations uh, of, the, uh, of, a, of a word that leads to the reversal errors. And you can see this in typically developing children and in children with uh, dyslexia. 
uh, but it almost always dissipates, and it's not it's not a it's not a sign of dyslexia, nor is it something that really requires treatment. We had a question concerning English language learners. And before I ask it, I just want to tell our attendees that we do have a webinar in this series specifically on structured literacy instruction and English language learners. So it will also help clarify. But the question was, is identification and prevention of dyslexia different for English language learners? It, uh, the principles that I'm talking about are universal across different kinds of languages not only uh, in terms of the uh, alphabetic principle, uh, but also uh, the type of instruction that kids uh, need. They have to learn the alphabetic principle. Uh, even in what Elsa will tell you, uh, Elsa and our close colleagues, she will tell you that uh, the main difference between learning to read in English and learning to read in Spanish is that the breakdown that occurs in Spanish is at the level of the syllable and not at the uh, level of individual uh, letter sound uh, relationships. And that's because the Spanish language is much more transparent. But if you look at what we would do to screen, for example, for dyslexia, it would still be things like letter sounds, phonological awareness, uh, because even, even kids that are minority uh, language learners have these problems in both uh, language, and that defines risk. Uh, Elsa has participated in studies with Sharon Vaughn, uh, where they've identified uh, kids at risk. Uh, th these are English learners in both English and Spanish, taught them in either English or in Spanish, got similar uh, results in terms of the outcomes, depending on whether they're taught in English or in Spanish, but demonstrated very poor transferability uh, of the reading instruction between English and Spanish, and that that was more dependent on the child's language uh, proficiency in either English or Spanish. Uh, so the same principles hold, except the difference in the orthography leads to differences in what you'll eventually focus on in teaching the child who continues to struggle. And Elsa Cardenas Hagen is actually the expert on that webinar that will be part of our series this year. So it was a perfect example. Um, we have a question in the chat that said, so is dys dyslexia simply a lack of response to reading intervention? No, it is not that, that, it, no, that I, I'm not trying to say that. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if you're at risk for dyslexia, you need more intense, more explicit, more targeted uh, instruction. Uh, and if you get that, uh, you may be able to develop the uh, neural systems. But I'm also saying that what we want to do is to get to a point where uh, inadequate response to instruction is a primary defining attribute because all kids get quality instruction and those who continue to struggle are the ones that we really focus on. Great. We had a question from a school psychologist, and the question is, SELPAs across California are asking school psychs to use Processing Strengths and Weaknesses, PSW, to qualify students under SLD. How can practitioners... I cannot tell you how ridiculous that is. Um, there is no evidence for the validity of methods that are based on processing strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the, the people who promote these types of methods have done no studies uh, themselves. Uh, I, I will glad you can go on our website and you will find a manual uh, that we wrote for the Texas Education Agency on the validity of different kinds of identification methods. Uh, where we summarize the uh, research studies available for PSW methods and show that they are neither reliable nor valid, and that the only effect of these types of methods is to under-identify children who have learning disabilities, including uh, dyslexia. It forces school psychologists to spend all their time in assessment when what school psychologists should be working on is uh, uh, progress monitoring and, and intervention, along with the speech pathologists, school psychologists are often the most educated people in the building, and it's a shame not to focus them on intervention. It was exactly the follow-up question, which is how can practitioners like me, like her, um, better work with counties to advocate for MTSS and RTI rather than PSW? Any suggestions? Well, you could look at the research literature 
which uh, shows very clearly that uh, the only classification that has any kind of empirical validity is one that's based on uh, uh, basically problems with reading and spelling and evidence of instru inadequate instructional response. You can operationalize uh, these methods very easily. They're, they, I mean, for example, if you go to the state of Tennessee uh, website, you can find a beautiful graphic that talks about what they call a hybrid model, which is actually a, a model that was uh, developed by uh, Joe Kovalinski and uh, uh, Amanda Vander Hayden. But it's also a model that we've worked with uh, for probably 20 years uh, at this point. And in the uh, manual for practitioners that we developed for the state of Texas, where 55% of districts use a PSW method, uh, uh, you will find uh, an alternative approach to identification that, great, that, that complies with the requirements for a comprehensive assessment in IDEA, uh, but doesn't take uh, eight hours uh, to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's treat and test, not test and treat. We spend far too many resources on finding the right child and not getting children in intervention. I know these are strong opinions. Not everybody agrees, uh, but I can back it up. What is the best use of instructional time for middle school students who may have double deficits? Uh, double deficits, I, I, um, I assume were, you're referring to uh, rate and accuracy problems, uh, you know, either, either the double deficit model from Mary Ann Wolf, who will probably talk about that, or the, uh, which, which I, I prefer to talk about is the rate accuracy uh, dichotomy that Maureen Lovett uh, talks about. I think it depends on the child, I mean, on the adolescent uh, and what they need. I mean, I mean, what we do in our adolescent studies is we give kids a, a fluency probe and we basically put them in homogeneous groups uh, based on whether they need instruction in decoding, fluency, and uh, comprehension. Uh, if decoding is adequate, which is indicated by fluency scores at a certain level, uh, then we would put them in a group that focused on fluency and comprehension instruction. And if they don't have problems with decoding and fluency, which means they read more than X words per minute, uh, we would put them in a comprehension. Uh, group. Uh, and then we would differentiate uh, based on the lesson plan uh, within those groups. So I don't think you can uh, simply say that that there's a recipe for uh, kids in middle school. They vary considerably. And what you have to do instead is try and personalize as much as possible, depending on what their needs are. But you can do that pretty easily uh, with fluency measures. We have time for about one last question. And of course, it's one that we could spend a whole nother webinar on. But the question was, how do you respond to people who say that balanced literacy works if done well? Well, uh, if, a, if, if you take a balanced literacy program and you introduce a component that has explicit instruction in word work, that's at least 10 minutes of every lesson, I would agree with that. Uh, and in the study that I referred to, the Mathis study, we intentionally took what uh, would represent a reading recovery approach and added uh, explicit word work. We did it in groups of three. We used level text. There were no decoding text. We taught in the context of reading and writing, uh, but everything was explicit. Nothing was incidental. It was all teacher directed. And so if your balanced literacy program uh, does that, then I would agree uh, with it. And we actually um, uh, introduced uh, what we call balanced literacy uh, programs a long time ago. This was at Barbara Foreman and I in 1996 and 1997 coined the term balanced literacy to refer to integration of phonics and comprehension, but we never intended to refer to incidental teaching of phonics. And so, uh, uh, as uh, Claude Goldenberg and others have shown, most balanced literacy curriculums uh, teach a multiple cueing system. They teach uh, phonics incidentally as needed, and that is not gonna be as effective as an approach that includes an explicit alphabetic word work component. Well, thank you, Dr. Fletcher. This was an amazing webinar and we've learned so much with you today. So thank you for your time and your expertise. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.